Test two. Number eighteen. Dear Mayor Simmons, my children have been swimming at Clark Swim Center since they were five years old. Through this, they have kept in great cardiovascular as well as muscular condition. The swim meets held at the pool provide opportunities for neighbors to compete, and they encourage parents to work together to host a successful swim meet. When my family heard that the pool would be closed from October, my kids were very disappointed. I am strongly opposed to the proposed measure to close down the pool. Closing this pool would seriously affect many kids and committed athletes. While I understand the closure is related to controlling the city budget, the swim center serves a critical recreational need for local residents, especially children. I strongly request the city council reconsider closing it. Sincerely, David Robinson. Number nineteen. It was a fresh autumn afternoon. The sun shone brightly against the changing leaves. My two dogs, Buddy and Ava, were in need of getting out, so that's just what we did. It was the best part of my day. The cool air felt refreshing in my lungs as I jogged. The area I normally walk in was busy with schoolchildren, so I took a different route. As I turned the corner next to a busy highway, both pups alerted me that something was wrong. By flanking my sides and pressing their warm, furry bodies against my yoga pants, both of them growled low, hair raised on their backs. I started to look around. That was when I saw him. He was a large man with slicked back hair, a black coat, a large hooked nose, and sharp eyes. I thought he could attack me at any moment. A chill ran down my spine. The cool, refreshing air now burned my lungs. Number twenty. In the preschool environment, children are given an opportunity to engage in imaginative play, and are able to further develop social skills learned from their families at home. However, in today's high-pressure world, some preschools may be overemphasizing academic materials more than social skills and play. It is important for parents to adequately research various preschool environments to ensure that a preschool environment is the right fit for the child. Young children learn best through hands-on, playful activities. Caregivers should be wary of preschools with too many academic worksheets. For example, while parents often feel great seeing a page where their child has written the letter B numerous times, the child may have been extremely frustrated completing the assignment if his or her fine motor skills were not ready. Having a child draw the letter in the sand with a stick may be a better choice. Number twenty-one. Many species have languages. Birds and baboons can warn others in their group of the approach of predators, but animal languages can share only the simplest of ideas. Almost all of them linked to what is immediately present, a bit like mime. Several researchers have tried to teach chimps to talk, and chimps can indeed acquire and use vocabularies of one or two hundred words. They can even link pairs of words in new patterns, but their vocabularies are small. And they don't use syntax or grammar, the rules that allow us to generate a huge variety of meanings from a small number of verbal tokens. Their linguistic ability seems never to exceed that of a two or three-year-old human, and that is not enough to create today's world. And here's where the butterfly flapped its wings. Human language crossed a subtle linguistic threshold that allowed utterly new types of communication. Above all, human languages let us share information about abstract entities, or about things or possibilities that are not immediately present, and may not even exist outside of our imagination. Number twenty-two. Most people fear many things, both great and small, and though we may never have to face up to our worst nightmares. Few of us are unfamiliar with the sweaty palms and parched lips that are typical physical accompaniments to the emotion of fear. Fear is not, of course, a pleasant sensation, and it often impedes our acting in the ways we think we ought to. For those reasons, we might consider that humankind would have been better off if endowed with a literally fearless nature, but that would be a big mistake. 
For frail and vulnerable creatures like ourselves, a disposition to feel fear is a vital evolutionary acquisition, since it prompts us to take care of ourselves in situations of danger. Those who feared nothing would dare anything, and the consequences would all too often be disastrous. Fear, it is true, sometimes applies the brakes too sharply to our efforts, but it is better to possess brakes that are occasionally over effective than to have no brakes at all. Number 23. Clean water is to fish what clean air is to people. Unfortunately, as a result of human activities, aquatic environments are being degraded as they receive excess sediments from deforested areas, contaminated waters from cities, and agricultural fields, and other human and animal wastes. Located at the interface between land and water, wetlands intercept water and sediments coming from uplands. In this position, Wetlands act as natural filters where excess nutrients can be stored or transformed in the sediments or taken up by plants for growth. Contaminants, e.g. agrochemicals and heavy metals, can be bound to sediments, dissolved in runoff water, or transformed to less harmful forms by plants or microbes. Wetland vegetation also slows runoff and traps sediments that otherwise would go offshore, increasing water turbidity and sedimentation in the oceans. Number 24. In recent years, an increasing number of separation walls have been built around the world. It is estimated that in the last decade, almost 40,000 kilometers of walls and fences have been built in 65 major projects. Observers regularly voice worries about the current worldwide expansion of walls. By and large, it is assumed that their presence fosters divisions and inequality. In particular, walls built in urban areas where human density is higher and social diversity more accentuated have exacted a heavy toll in terms of political divisions, ecological degradation, and human suffering. At the same time, however, homeless and displaced people, unprotected by any wall, are often terrorized by irregular militias, kidnapped by criminal networks, captured or evicted by state police, and have likewise endured terrible ordeals. In war zones, war is increasingly using techniques of wall piercing. From time to time, walls are invoked, promised, contested, challenged, and struggled over. They can be protective, but the protection they grant is always selective to a significant degree. Number 25. Top 10 countries by retail e-commerce sales and year-over-year -year percentage change in 2018 and 2019. The table above shows the retail e-commerce sales of the top 10 countries in 2018 and 2019 and the percentage change in sales between the two years. All 10 countries showed an increase in retail e-commerce sales from 2018 to 2019. China ranked first, recording more than $1,500 billion of retail e-commerce sales in both 2018 and 2019, followed by the U.S. The retail e-commerce sales of the U.K., Japan, and South Korea were over $100 billion in 2019, but the percentage change of retail e-commerce sales between the two years of Japan was the second smallest among the ten countries. The retail e-commerce sales of Germany were larger than those of France, both in 2018 and 2019 but France showed a greater percentage change in sales than Germany over the two years. Canada, India, and Russia all showed less than $50 billion in retail e-commerce sales in 2018 and 2019, but India showed the greatest percentage change in retail e-commerce sales among the ten listed countries. Number 26. The sun bleak is a surface-feeding fish that lives in areas of Asia and Eastern Europe, favoring slow-flowing and still waters. It is believed to have been introduced into English fresh waters from aquarium releases in Hampshire in the mid-1980s.
It is now recorded from lakes, rivers, and brooks across the country, particularly in southern counties, and is thought to be spreading. The sun bleak is bright silver in color and can be easily identified by the incomplete lateral line that fades shortly before the end of the pectoral fin. This species grows to adult size very quickly and is capable of breeding after only its first year of life. Eggs are laid in the spring and summer months in batches firmly glued to water plants, which the males then guard to enhance the chances of survival. Number 27 Ridgewood Community Center, Ukulele Class Learn to play the ukulele in a relaxed, fun-filled environment in the Ridgewood Community Center's Ukulele Class. This eight-week class starts in the first week of November and will meet on Thursdays from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. You will learn basic chords, strumming patterns, and chord chart reading, so by the end of the class, you'll be able to play a lot of fun songs. Dates, November 3rd to December 22nd. Age range, 12 years old and above. Class length, 60 minutes. Cost, $70. Additional information. There are no refunds or makeup classes. Participants must pay in full before the first day of class. Participants must bring their ukulele. We do not offer loaner ukuleles. Call 724 822 4461 with questions or to sign up. Number 28 2022 Marine Life T shirt Design Contest. Show your creativity by entering the 2022 Marine Life T-Shirt Design Contest. Your design could be chosen as the official 2022 Marine Life T-Shirt. Rules Designs will appear on the front of the shirt. Designs must be entirely original. Use of any copyrighted images is prohibited. Designs must include marine wildlife. Designs must be in color. Any fonts used must be legally licensed for use in extended commercial production. Submissions should be sent to t-shirtdesign at marinelife.org as JPEG or PDF files. All entry emails should have the subject line 2022 Marine Life T-Shirt Design Contest. Judging will be based on originality, clarity of message, and artistic quality. Submission Deadline July 3rd, 11.59 p.m. Number 29 Have you ever seen a Siberian husky run on a bright, cool day? You can practically see the joy on its face as it does what it was bred to do. The husky is realizing its purpose for life, what it is meant to be. The husky's telos, Greek for direction or purpose, the reason humans have selectively bred them is to be a helper for humans. Specifically, they are bred to run, pull sleds, and protect and warm their humans in cool climates. Contrast that image with a husky on a hot summer day in Southern California as it is forced to walk slowly beside its human caretaker. Its countenance is slightly bowed and deflated, its mouth open, tongue lying limply out one side of its mouth. This contrast suggests that an individual husky shows signs of thriving when it can run and pull and be near its human in a setting appropriate to its physiology. These features are part of the individual dimension of the husky's thriving. Number 30. The time has come to incorporate emotional literacy into the school curriculum. It is not a new subject because feelings are at the heart of learning and living as a human being. It is simply a choice as to whether we consciously manage them effectively and teach children how to self-manage their feelings in an effective way, using the languages of the feeling life, or whether we ignore, repress, or deny feelings and continue to focus on cognitive literacy alone. When feelings are addressed in schools, it is done using the verbal languages of cognitive literacy. These languages are inadequate for the task, as evidenced by the increasing number of feelings that manifest into challenging behaviors that need psychological referral 
or a psychiatric drug intervention in primary school children. If we introduce emotional literacy and use the languages of the feeling life, which are primarily non-verbal, to help children to identify and process their basic human feeling states, then many of today's school behavioral problems will not emerge. Number thirty-one. Places like Rome and Xi'an and every other ancient metropolis represent a spectacular change in the way that humans related to their environments and to one another. In urban settlements, unfamiliarity became the measure of human relations. The first cities were larger than the largest family-like village, and the people who moved into those settlements had to suppress a suspicion of others from the very first day. People had to adapt to densely crowded neighborhoods full of people they had never seen before. They had to negotiate ritual and political relationships with other newcomers, and they had to accept the near constant dissonance of interacting with people representing different cultures, languages, and customs. Encounters with strangers were no longer limited to the occasional addition of a newlywed to the collective hearth. But constituted a recurring condition of daily life. People moved in and out of the city, coming and leaving as new opportunities opened up. As they worked, played, and shopped, urban residents had to constantly update their roster of relationships. Number thirty-two. The story behind the launch of the first cake mix powders is a perfect example of post-rationalization as a consequence of unconscious consumer attitudes. The product in question started off with very meager sales. During marketing research, consumers pointed out the product's advantages: quick and easy to prepare, but also mentioned its artificial taste and used this to explain why they were not interested in buying it. However, once the consumers tasted the cake without knowing that it was made from a cake mix blind test, they couldn't differentiate between the cake made from cake mix and the one made in a traditional way, demonstrating that the real problem was not actually its taste. The projective technique showed that the underlying factor making it difficult for the housewives to accept the product was their unconscious belief that something as special as a cake for their family should require more time and effort. The artificial taste opinion was a typical post-rationalization of a negative, implicit attitude towards the product. Number thirty-three. We have evolved various mechanisms for regulating body temperature. Drinking water and sweating can cool us down, as can sending blood to the surface of the skin. When we need to warm up, the hairs on the surface of our skin stand on end, trapping a layer of warmer air close to the body. And in extreme cases, our muscles may begin to involuntarily contract as we shiver. Astonishingly, social insect colonies also thermoregulate in this way. The best studied case is the honey bee, where on hot days, some workers are tasked with the role of bringing water to the hive and spraying it over the combs, allowing evaporation to cool the hive from within. The colony sweats. In the winter, when the hive can become too cold, other workers act like the shivering muscles in your body. By vibrating their flight muscles rapidly to generate heat, to power this energetically demanding activity, other bees in the colony shuttle honey back and forth to fuel the heater bees. In both multicellular bodies and in social insect colonies, therefore, the constituent parts seem to bear adaptations that are designed to promote a greater good. Number thirty-four. What is time? Here is a concept we all think we understand, and one that physics requires. Yet both ordinary folk and physicists would be hard pressed to tell us what exactly time is. Notice that to define time in terms of hours, minutes, and seconds is to mistake the units of time for what they measure. It would be like defining space in terms of meters or yards. Space is measured with equal accuracy in meters or yards, but suppose we ask which is the correct way of measuring space. 
The answer, of course, is that there is no uniquely correct set of units for measuring space. Yards and meters do equally well. By the same token, neither can be said to define or constitute space. The same goes for time. Seconds, centuries, millennia are just different amounts of the same thing. And it's that thing, time, which comes in different amounts that we want a definition of. We could say that time is duration, but then duration is just the passage of time. Our definition would presuppose the very notion we set out to define. Number 35. If you look closely at imposing peaks in the Rocky Mountains or the Alps, another aspect of Earth history may snap into focus. Their tooth like shapes don't reflect deposition. On the contrary, they are being sculpted by erosion, physical and chemical processes that wear away rocks, eradicating their stories. Earth writes its history with one hand and erases it with the other. And as we go further back in time, erasure gains the upper hand. Our planet coalesced some 4.54 billion years ago, but Earth's oldest known rocks date back only to about 4 billion years. Older rocks must have existed, but they've been eroded away or were buried and transformed through metamorphism into unrecognizable form. Understanding Earth's history helps us appreciate how the mountains, oceans, trees, and animals around us came to be, not to mention gold, diamonds, coal, oil, and the very air we breathe. A few may still lie in some remote Canadian or Siberian hillside waiting to be recognized, but largely the first 600 million years of Earth history constitutes our planet's dark age. Number 36. The problem with comparing language with spider web spinning is that language just isn't an instinct, not in the same sense of the term as used by the layperson, nor as used by the scientist. Spider web spinning, like other instinctive behaviors, emerges developmentally, without instruction, input, or interference from any other member of a given species. Spiders spin webs whether they are exposed to artisan spiders performing web spinning or not. Human language just doesn't emerge in this way. Exposure to language is required. And not any old input will do. There has to be lots of it. Over several years for language to develop. Moreover, language exposure must take place in a normal human socio cultural context, resulting in distinct varieties. Children grow up speaking the language of their mothers, carers, and the community in which they live. A child exposed to the West African language, Wolof, will grow up speaking Wolof, whilst a child living in Lombardy, in northern Italy, will grow up speaking Lombard. Number 37. Each day we are flooded with examples re describing something in one domain in terms of another domain to clarify or advance our thinking. For example, in Her Life is a House of Cards, we recognize that using playing cards to create a domicile is a fragile enterprise because the house frequently falls apart with the slightest breeze, nudge from our fingers, or vibration in the room. This may be similar to the chaotic relationships and economic upheaval in a person's life, each one threatening to knock the entire enterprise into disarray. You may also notice that the metaphor has become a cliche, because it is used so pervasively that it is no longer fresh to the reader. As a result, we wonder is this a good metaphor? It may be, if we haven't heard the cliche, More likely, we can find a better comparison that would advance our thinking. In other words, teneo vestri celebratio, know your audience. The skillful comparison of different terms enables us to generate the power of the metaphor, understanding its strengths and its limitations, where it doesn't work as well as where it does. Number 38. Dialect is a particularly interesting marker of group membership. With the nationalization and globalization of mass media, both accents and dialects are fading, but for most of human history, they were localized. They're hard to fake, unless you're a rare, gifted mimic, and they're generally set by adolescence.
There is a lot of evidence worldwide that people are predisposed to cooperate with someone who speaks the same dialect they do. For instance, in one experiment, subjects were more likely to trust people with the same accent they had. And we naturally change our patterns of speech and body language to mimic those around us, unconsciously trying to fit into the group. Of course, the flip side of this is that we're less likely to trust people who don't sound like we do. Again, dialect preference seems to be a vestigial kin recognition system. Number 39. It is intuitively evident that the built environment affects our well being. You only have to think of the pleasure to be had from a walk on the common or a visit to a street market bumping into people you know. Or, on the downside, the danger of crossing a busy road or cycling behind a diesel bus. But despite this intuitive recognition, there is a widespread assumption that biology is more important than ecology in determining our health and well being. This assumption is manifest, for example, in the degree of blame we may attach to our genes and the degree to which we assume the remedy for bad health is medicine or surgery. We spend huge amounts of scarce resources on curative medicine, and our preventative measures are largely biological as well, i.e., inoculation. All the while, we are paying scant attention to the social and environmental conditions which are, on some calculations, at least equally important. Number 40. From the earliest films of the silent era to modern day blockbusters, Music is used extensively to shape viewers' beliefs and attitudes about the actions, events, and dialogue in a film. Music affects beliefs about whether characters are being truthful or deceptive, and it indicates to viewers whether a situation should be interpreted as dangerous, romantic, or humorous. Music has these effects indirectly and deceptively. When music is not part of the diegesis of the film, composers avoid drawing attention to their music. A subtle or manipulative approach is adopted, because beliefs about film are less compelling if viewers feel that they have been forced onto them. Unlike most forms of persuasion, film music does not openly invite viewers to adjust their beliefs. Instead, viewers are typically unaware of the dynamic role that music plays in subtly shaping their beliefs about actions, characters, and dialogue. Indeed, many viewers leave films with little or no awareness of the music. Film music induces viewers to interpret the narrative elements of the film in the intended direction without noticing it. Numbers 41 and 42. If fossil fuel is a slave at our beck and call, renewable power is more like a partner. As we shall eventually see, that partnership could be immensely rewarding for people and communities, but can it power economic growth of the kind we're used to? The theoretical economist's answer, of course, is that no particular commodity matters all that much, because if we run short, someone will have the incentive to develop a substitute. In general, this has proved true in the past. Run short of nice big saw logs, and someone invents plywood. But it's far from clear that it applies to fossil fuel, which in its ubiquity and its cheapness is almost certainly a special case. Wars are fought over oil, not over milk, not over semiconductors, not over timber. It's plausible, indeed it's likely, that if we begin to run short, the nature of our lives may fundamentally change as the scarcity destroys our economies. The essence of the first industrial revolution was not the coal. It was how to use the coal, insists Jeffrey Sachs. Maybe he's right, but it seems more likely that fossil fuel was an exception to the rule, a one-time gift that backed a one-time intense period of growth. In any event, we seem to be on track to find out. Numbers 43 through 45 When his parents died, Matt dropped out of school and became a dishwasher. He was only 12 when a Baltimore ship captain took him on as a cabin boy. The captain showed the orphan how to read, write, and navigate a ship. 
When the ship's captain died, Matt was again on his own. He returned to Washington, D.C., where he met Captain Robert E. Perry, who was sailing south to survey the feasibility of a canal across Nicaragua. When he met Matt, he was surprised that an 18-year-old knew so much about navigation, so he hired the teen as his personal valet. During their two years in Central America, Perry's vision to explore the Arctic Circle triggered a passion in Matt. In 1895, they traveled to Greenland on a trip that turned to disaster. They barely survived the winter. When they found refuge with an Inuit tribe, Matt became the first American to master their difficult language. He also learned how to build dog sleds, kayaks, and igloos, taking tips from the locals in surviving the harsh Arctic. Perry knew that his valet was the key to making it to the North Pole. After several failed attempts, in 1908, they began their final shot at reaching the northernmost point on the planet. The two mushed north, slogging a trail through ice fields, across yawning crevices, and over towering glaciers in the face of temperatures that dropped to 65 degrees below zero. As they finally came within sight of their goal, Captain Parry was exhausted, so Matt continued on, becoming the first man in history to stand at the North Pole. He then went back to get Perry. The captain was furious that his valet had planted the first flag, and forever after refused to speak to him. The party arrived home to a hero's welcome. Proud Americans celebrated Captain Perry with parades and receptions, applauding him as the first man to stand at the North Pole. Nobody took notice of Matt. Yet today the world knows it was Matthew Henson who was the first to reach the North Pole. Maybe if he hadn't been African American, or if he hadn't been Perry's valet, he'd have been recognized sooner. But some 35 years after the journey, Matt was finally awarded the Medal of Honor.